Hello, and welcome to Tiffany Teach Tuesday. <clears throat> this month, as I said, we're going to talk about building generational wealth. And this topic was brought to me to discuss by a friend that I should just talk about it. And it's something that I always talk about amongst my family and friends. And I know some people like, oh, why should keep talking about this? What difference does it make? Some people don't even realize how wealthy they might be until they decide to do some estate planning. But another thing that I'm going to discuss today is building this wealth. How do you start about building it? How do you continue to build it after you've gone? And how do you continue your legacy to go on and continue to build generational wealth with your family? So I'm going to talk about first thing is six things that we're going to discuss today. And the first thing is talking about financial situations, finances. In a lot of communities, especially African-American communities, people get real sensitive about their finances. And believe it or not, they get sensitive because they don't even understand it or have any idea of where their finances are at. Having that conversation, especially with your children, is important. Because for some reason or another, your children think that you're rich. Some of them think you're rich and got money at your disposal because you always seem to make things happen. And I say this because as a child growing up, my parents helped us out real quick. Like money don't grow on trees. If you want money, you got to work for it. These are the bills we have to pay and this is what we bringing in. However, we have gotten in a society where we make our children believe that money comes easily and they have no sense of responsibility. So you're building this wonderful life for your children that when you leave this earth, they're not going to be able to maintain. How do you avoid that happening? Hello, Sean, how you doing? How do you avoid that happening? You... Talk, have the conversation about money. Why are we scared to talk about money? I do not know. You don't have to talk about it like, hey, I got this amount of money in the bank. But hey, what are you doing to bring in other streams of income? What are you? This is what money looks like when you're talking to your children. Like, listen, we have a light bill, a gas bill, a water bill. When I was an educator, I used to do this uh, this class with my students when helping them to pick their careers. And so how they would pick their careers is they will first, I will ask them, what do they life look like after high school or college? What do they see themselves? What do they plan to do? Do they plan to get an apartment? Do they plan on buying a house? Do they plan on getting a car? What are your future, near future goals? Because in the next three to four years, you're leaving your, your parents expect you to be doing something because you're out of high school. So they will say, someone said, well, I want a car, this kind of car. So I make them research how much this type of car costs. Someone said, I'm going to buy me a house. I make them research, well, what it takes to buy a house, what you need to get a house. Someone said, I want an apartment. Well, what size apartment? One bedroom, a studio, three bedrooms. We would get the classifieds and look up the type of bedrooms they have. And so then I say, okay, well, we add up all of these expenses for this lifestyle. I say, are you going to party every night? How much are you going to spend on kicking it after you get off the work? And they were like, well, I'm going to spend this amount. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. So we add up all of these expenses. And then I said, okay, so you need about two, $3,000 a month to live this lifestyle. Some of them have more simpler lifestyles. I said, okay, well, what are you planning to go to school for? What kind of job do you plan on getting? So they tell me they jobs. I said, okay, well, this job makes this amount of money. I said, so we're going to divide that by 12 and this is what you make monthly. I said, now, wait a minute now. You got to take out 20%. They said, 20%? What are we taking out 20% for? I said, well, you got to pay for your taxes because the government wants this tax money. Well, federal government wants theirs. The certain states, the local government wants their tax money too. Then you have to take out for, are you going to have some health insurance? Because now if you get sick, you got to have health insurance to go to the doctor. I said, you may want to invest in your 401k. three. So we're going to take about 20% of that salary. And that's what's going to be what we call your net pay. What you bring home after all of your deductions. OK, so now we're down to this point. I say, OK, now, if you renting, you still got to pay light bill, gas bill, water. But they say water. Who pay for water? I said, oh, baby, water ain't free in America. 
Now, these children didn't understand that you have to pay for water. Now, their parents probably should have told them that. I said, now, if you're renting, depending on where you're renting and have what type of place you're renting, the water might be included in your rent. But if you own a home, you pay your own water bill. So when your child turn on the water in the kitchen and then go to use the bathroom and then go downstairs and the water in the kitchen is still running, you might want to tell them that water you're running ain't free, baby. But we don't even tell our children these simple things. When they come in the house and they turn on the light switch, my daddy used to do this all the time, turn on the light, leave out the room, and then he'll come into the room where we at and he'll switch the light off. And we're like, what you turn that light off for? He said, because you're going to be sitting in the dark unless you're paying this bill because lights are not for free. He said, you like them turning on and off. He said, well, guess what? We have to pay for that to happen. So when you leave that other room, you need to make sure you turn off the lights, teaching you responsibilities. Okay. So having that financial conversation with your family, be it children, be it your spouse, be it your parents, whoever it is that you are in, what's the word I'm looking for, have a relationship with, you should be having that conversation if you plan on building and leaving a legacy because if you don't, they will take what you build and they will destroy it. How can you expect your child to build off of what you have established if you have started them out with a weak foundation. That's with anybody. And I always will ask my students, if you build a house on a weak foundation, what will happen? They say, oh, it'll fall apart. And I said, well, right now, the fundamentals is now that you're learning. So you build, you can do quicksand, water, solid surface. I don't know what you want to do, but you need to build something that's strong enough to so that if you want to grow or build, build the building of your life as tall as the Sears Tower or bigger than that, then you can do that. These are the basic fundamentals. So that's number one. Number two, once you have had the discussion and you understand your finances, where your financial goals are in life, you need to get professionals to help you. You don't know everything. Because as my mother used to tell me, Tiffany, you can be a master, a jack of all trades and a master of none, or you can master something. So what I've decided to do is master real estate. This is what I'm mastering. This is what I'm good at. Building wealth through real estate. This is what I master. When it comes to my financial planning, I pay a financial advisor to advise me on what I should do with my extra income, where I should make better decisions with my money because I don't have time to watch the stock market every day because I'm watching this real estate market. I don't have time to be moving, to get to move and sell the stock because I'm over here trying to make sure I close these deals and get the documents in for my clients. So you need to have somebody that's in your corner that know what they're doing, period. Secondly, I have an attorney. I have a whole bunch of attorneys and I keep them on deck. Because attorneys are important, depending on what area of business you're going in. I have an attorney that will be coming to speak with us, my estate planner. Her name is Denise Russo, attorney Denise Russo. She is to help me with my estate planning. And I met her in a networking group, and she helped me understand the importance of planning. Why you should have your affairs in order if God was to call you off this earth to keep your money from going to probate court, which I have discussed to you all. So on July 26, I will have her on for a brief moment to talk about financial, I mean, about real estate planning to ensure that you would make a plan so that if your children or whoever you leave behind don't have to go fighting over and argue with other folks about what you what your wishes are. So a financial planner can help you to set up a plan and strategy on what to do with your finances. And an attorney will help you to protect all of those things that you have in place to make sure you have the right proper documents in place for whatever you desire to do. OK, so that's number two. Number three. Get into a build a business, a building business. So find something that you can build income, a business. It's some of my, most of my clients pick one of their wealth building tools as real estate. They work most of, majority of my clients. As a matter of fact, all of my clients have a job, have a career. They have something that they enjoy getting up to do in the morning or they doing it to build a level of legacy, to have the resources. They are not rich. They are everyday working people that are taking what they earn and investing it into something that builds about income for them. And they establish them. And most of my clients have limited liability companies that they put their assets in. That is their business. They don't run it day to day. 
I do. So I am the manager of their business. They are the sole owners and members of it, but I manage their business for them. So you can buy Subway, you can buy a Kinko's, you can buy a hotel chain. You don't necessarily have to run it and operate it, but you can have someone else to manage it for you and you bring back the resources for that, okay? Number three. Number four, the best business to invest in, believe it or not, is the insurance business. It is a complete money maker. Why? Because <laughs> the insurance business, so you can invest in some stocks, it should be in insurance, because guess what? How many people buy insurance policies Term on top of that, those are the best ones that make the best amount of money. You buy a 20 year policy, you pay your $30 a month, and in 20 years, the policy is no good. And you have to go get you another 20 year policy, and it's going to be even more expensive. And you're going to buy that policy and pay for it for 20 years, and you still ain't died. So now let's say you bought the first policy at 20, now you're at 40. So now you're gonna buy another 20 year term policy for 20 more years, and you haven't died because now you're 60. They making all of this money off these policies that you are not cashing in on. Talking about a money maker, that's a money maker. And believe it or not, that's what Warren Buffett invests most of his money in, insurance policies. They no brainers. It's no overhead work. You buy some stocks in insurance companies, and most of the insurance companies are still here a hundred years later, making money off policies that people never cash in. Some people die and their families don't know anything about their financial affairs. Don't even know Auntie Jones had a three million dollar policy that she'd been paying off for annuity, and nobody comes to claim it. And insurance money just sits there. And after they stop making so many payments on it, it automatically laps, which means now they have no rights to it and it's gone. Hey, insurance, good money. Next, number five, building multiple levels of streams of income. Now, this here is a money maker. You build multiple levels of streams of income, making your hobby a money maker for you. You like doing that because now with technology, you can do anything you enjoy and make money off. You go get a TikTok page and do a couple of TikToks and you like making jewelry and you can make jewelry on the side because you do it, you know, you crochet, you whatever I think is a hobby, you can take that and make it as another stream of income. Building multi levels of stream of income when this economy hit and tank people who had multiple levels of streams of income wasn't affected as individuals who had that only form of income. If you like hanging out at the bar and you know how to make drinks, get your part-time bartending job and you can still hang out, have fun and make money. It's all kinds of things that you can do. You like cooking, start baking cakes, doing catering, anything you can do to build in another stream of income for you helps you to build generational wealth. Last and not least, the most important, is making sure you have life insurance. Now, I was talking to an insurance broker and she said to me, Tiffany, believe it or not, black people do buy insurance policies, especially our grandparents and parents. They buy policies. However, they just don't have enough coverage. Make sure you have enough coverage. And what that means is if you have this amount of debt and you die today, you have enough to pay off that debt and leave the loved ones you behind something to bury you, maybe whatever the desires you want them to do with the money, you need to have enough in policy money to cover that. You never know when someone may die. Other people insure everybody in their family, other races. So they get insurance for their grandmama, their niece, their nephew, their cousins, and they don't get, they get policies when they're younger because the younger they are, the younger you, when you get your policy, the bigger return you get off of it. Uh, it's cheaper for them to pay, it's cheaper to fund it. And so as they get older, it can build money. So the best policy, life insurance policy to get is called a universal life policy. It builds, it's like buying a money market. It builds equity in it over the value of, of a lifetime, over the value of what the policy value is. You can borrow against it. You can um, put it back. But life insurance policy is the number one way a lot of people 
build generational wealth and pass it on because life insurance policies cannot be taxed, garnished or taken away from you. So you don't have to go to probate court or anything. Life insurance policies is the number one way people pass on generational wealth. It's just that we don't get enough money in our policies. We get term policies, which every 20 years they lapse. I mean, they, they expire and you have to do it over and it becomes expensive. With a whole life policy, uh, is for the life of you. You have to constantly pay for this policy. Whereas with a universal life policy, once you have paid for it and you build enough equity in it that it funds itself, at a certain point in your life, you no longer have to put any money in it. It'll pay for itself to be um, equitable and your family can use it to bury you. You can use it as a, a retirement tool and then it's never uh, caught up in probate court. So the Six things we went over today. Talk about finances with your family. Get professional people to help you plan your uh, wealth and getting a good accountant. That's another thing. Get a good accountant. Get an accountant that knows the law well enough that they don't send you to jail, but they know how to find all the loopholes so you can keep your money in your pocket. Now, People used to get mad at Donald Trump because he didn't want to show his tax returns. But if he showed you his tax returns, he'll show you how talented his attorney, his tax accountant is, that they can find loopholes for things to help them make tax savings. Don't get mad at the rich because they know how to find, use their resources to save them money. Yes, they pay the least amount of taxes because the law was written by wealthy people who in turn want to ensure that they continue to build their generational wealth. So they have loopholes in place to ensure that their money is not taxed at the higher market as the working people. But as a working person, if you find something that you can do to write off on your taxes, you can have those tax breaks as well. Other than working every day would never make you wealthy, period. You will just make enough to get by. Number three, get into business, uh, building your own business. Four, uh, the best business to invest in is insurance. Five, find something you can do that's a hobby that you can make a stream of income and have multiple levels of income. And six, buy yourself a policy. So I hope that Tiffany Teach Tuesday taught you something on this Tuesday. In addition to that, remember July 26th, Six, if I'm not mistaken, that's a Saturday. Yeah, whatever two weeks from now is the that's the 27th. I'm sorry, July 27th, Tuesday, July 27th. I will have uh, an estate attorney, Denise Russo, on to talk about estate planning. So some of our people can get some more gems dropped on them so they can make this generational wealth for their family continue to go on. And there's some things about that that you all will be surprised, especially getting assistance from the government, how they make you sell everything. We're going to talk about that on July 26. So thank you again, as always, for tuning in for Tiffany Teach Tuesday, and I will see you all next week, Tuesday.